Morietta, you have taken my man John. Morietta, thousand miles gone. I had dreamed that he must not go. Go to New Mexico. Brigadier General Henry Hopkins Sibley. In the first few months of the war, he led the Sibley Brigade West, driven by a fantastic vision of a way for the South to win the war. But his campaign is one of the epic failures in the history of human conflict. Some said that Sibley was personally responsible for this disaster. Was Henry Sibley the man who lost the Civil War? Jefferson Davis approved the plan. Sibley would raise an army of volunteers in San Antonio, Texas. He would march the Sibley Brigade across the vast arid desert to Fort Bliss. There, the brigade would march up the Rio Grande, capturing the thinly garrisoned and demoralized federal forts in New Mexico. They would live off the captured provisions and off the land. Next, the Union stores at Albuquerque and Santa Fe would be seized. Sibley assumed that New Mexicans would flock to the southern cause. From there, they would cross Glorieta Pass to Fort Union. And when Fort Union fell, Colorado and its gold and silver would belong to the Confederacy. And Sibley's vision was grander still. Now the Army of New Mexico would turn west and establish an all-seasons route to the west coast. The greatest prize of all would be California and its warm weather ports. The Union blockade would be broken. Now the Confederacy would get what it most needed, the recognition of France or England. If either power intervened, the Second American Revolution would be complete. The Sibley Brigade reached Fort Bliss, Texas. Already there was news of victory. Lieutenant Colonel John Baylor and the Second Texas Mounted Rifles had preceded the Sibley Brigade into the Southwest. Baylor had captured not only Fort Fillmore, but its entire garrison. Sibley's vision remained intact. The first obstacle to fulfilling that vision was Fort Craig. The federal supplies there would be essential for Sibley's self-sustaining operation. The commander of Fort Craig was an old friend of Sibley's, Colonel Edward R.S. Canby. In response to the Confederate invasion of the territory, Canby had assembled over 3,800 men at Fort Craig. Many of Canby's men were Spanish-speaking recruits led by the legendary Colonel Kit Carson. Sibley contemplated an heroic frontal assault on Fort Craig, but first he consulted his officers. He and his officers arrived at a better plan. The brigade would bypass the fort and put itself in the middle of Union supply lines which ran north through Albuquerque, Santa Fe and Fort Union. Canby would be forced to come out in the open and fight. The trail crossed deep sand, the dust blew in the cold wind, and for at least 24 hours there would be no water but they might just make it to a place known as Valverde. Complaining of ill health, Sibley had retired to his ambulance. While his men faced the more tangible terrors of war, it seems that Sibley was fighting his own battles against alcoholism. But whatever the modern diagnosis of the general, most of Sibley's men diagnosed his condition as chronic cowardice. The command was turned over to Colonel Tom Green. Canby now knew he would not allow an enemy force to camp on his supply line. He decided he would have to go out and fight Sibley at Valverde. Canby's men seized the Valverde Ford. Major Charles Pyron led the Texas vanguard to a dry river course. The Union artillery now controlled the battlefield. Early in the afternoon, help arrived with Colonel Green and his 5th Texas. With them rode two Lancer companies. Lancer Captain Willis Lang caught sight of a unit of what he thought were New Mexico volunteers. 
Lang and his men were eager to make a glorious charge. The lancers moved out at a walk, then a canter, then a gallop. Some turned and fled, but most charged on to their glorious inevitable doom. The entire company was killed, wounded, or had fled. The Union troops and artillery pummeled the Confederate position. The rebel situation looked hopeless. But Tom Green was not the sort of man who would stand by and watch his boys systematically cut to pieces. He knew he couldn't hold the base of the Mesa, so he abandoned it and assembled his men on the right. Soon the fighting was hand to hand. Captain Alexander McRae and his men fought back with their rammers and short swords. In spite of these Union heroics, the Confederates overran the guns. The surviving Yankee troops fled back across the river. The jubilant Texans turned the guns and fired. Colonel Canby picked up a musket and tried to exhort his retreating men forward, but half of them had already broken and run. The man who would be remembered as the prudent soldier had no choice but to retreat to the fort. The Texans had driven Canby from the field, but he still held the fort, and he had supplies to last him for at least three months. General Sibley, now back in the saddle, found himself in deep trouble. He had lost 10% of his men. He had lost hundreds of horses and mules. Sibley chose to go north through a land that was in its third year of drought. In Socorro, they found New Mexico militiamen guarding federal supplies. But after a few rounds from the artillery, the New Mexicans ran away. The 5th captured the Yankee supplies and set up a forward base of operations. A few days later, General Sibley and the rest of the army reached Albuquerque. Both Canby and Sibley knew that Fort Union was well named. It was the Union's last hope of holding on to the Southwest. The fort was commanded by the veteran Colonel Gabriel Paul. His command included only a few hundred men, so Paul sent an urgent message to the Colorado Territory. In Colorado, there was enthusiastic support for the Union. Governor William Gilpin, with the help of several prominent pro-Union and abolitionist citizens, raised a regiment of Colorado volunteers. John Slough, a prominent Denver City lawyer, was named Colonel of the first Colorado Volunteers. Slough was not a military man, and he was very unpopular with his men. More to the volunteers' liking was the Reverend Major John Chivington. He was a huge man and had a reputation for cleaning up frontier towns. They called him the Fighting Parson. With the arrival of the Colorado Volunteers, the garrison at Fort Union had more than doubled its size. At first, this was good news for Colonel Paul. But then Colonel Slough announced that he had been commissioned colonel before Paul had been promoted to the same rank. This gave Slough seniority over the veteran Paul. The lawyer from Denver City was assuming command of Fort Union. Not knowing yet that Slough had taken command, Canby wrote to Paul. Fort Union must be held. All other points are of no importance. Harass the enemy, obstruct his movements, and remove any supplies that might fall into his hands. Do not move from Fort Union until I advise you. But Colonel Slough, eager to test himself in his first and what would turn out to be his only battle, decided he could stretch Canby's order to include launching an all-out offensive against the invaders. Slough ordered the bulk of his command to march over Glorietta Pass toward the Confederates, leaving relatively few men behind to protect the fort. Still back at Albuquerque, General Sibley seemed unaware that Slough's men were on the move. His own army was now scattered up and down the Santa Fe Trail. Major Pyron and Major Shropshire led 380 men to Johnson's Ranch at the mouth of Apache Canyon. Pyron had no way of knowing that same night, Chivington and his 418 men advance guard had already reached Pigeon's Ranch, which lay only a few miles away from the sleepless campsite. Major Pyron led his 80 Texans into the upper canyon and into the jaws of an approaching force which outnumbered him five to one. Pyron's men fought briefly, then fell back. Chivington sent in the cavalry. Captain Jacob Downing led his men around a hill on the Texans' left flank. Suddenly, they attacked from the rear. The Texans' muskets, shotguns, and pistols blazed. Downing's horse was killed, but his cavalry kept on coming. 
They jumped a gully and charged into the rebel flank. The Texans were routed. As the Texans retreated to Johnson's ranch, Chivingen decided to call it a day and withdrew his men all the way to Koslowski's ranch to wait for Slough. Pyron's 5th Texas was devastated. Back at Johnson's ranch, one man thought they had been outflanked, outnumbered, and outgeneraled. The following morning, Scurry decided to go out and find the enemy. When he left his thinly guarded supply train behind, he had made one of the most costly mistakes of the Civil War. Meanwhile, Colonel Slough seemed to be imitating Colonel Scurry. He waited briefly in ambush for the enemy, but soon he too grew impatient. First, he sent Chivington and his battalion over Gloria to Mesa in hopes that they would attack the Texans from behind. Then he set out himself to stage what he called a reconnaissance in force. By mid-morning, Slough's men had reached Pigeon's Ranch. They were glad to hear the order to fall out and stack arms. Slough sent a detachment of cavalry ahead to find the enemy. The scouts didn't have far to go. Only a half mile from the camp, they ran into Scurry's advance guard. The Confederate artillery opened fire. Under fire for the first time in his life, Slough attempted to flank the Texans on both the left and the right. But the strategy failed on both flanks. Slough withdrew to a defensive position at Pigeon's Ranch. It would be on the other end of the line, however, in a place which became known as Sharpshooter's Ridge, that the battle would be decided. While the ridge was nearly impossible to take from the steep western slope, on the east, the slope was moderate, and there was plenty of cover for an attack. The Texans flanked the ridge and came at the Coloradans from above. Once they had taken the ridge, they poured fire down on the Union artillery. The Confederates may have won the battle at Pigeon's Ranch, but Union Major John Chivington was not yet done with the fight. The fighting parson made his way across Gloria to Mesa with about 500 Coloradans. When they reached the western edge of the Mesa, Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Chavez pointed down to Johnson's ranch and said, you are right on top of the Major. There, 700 feet below, was the entire Confederate supply train. 80 wagons, hundreds of horses and mules, guarded by only a small force of Texans. The surprised rebels fired only two rounds from their six-pounder. Hopelessly outnumbered, those who could escaped. The Coloradans gleefully sacked the supply wagons. Then the wagons were burned and the Confederate hopes for victory burned with them. The Confederates had no choice but to return to Santa Fe. As they retreated, they passed Johnson's ranch and the burned remains of their supplies. Colonel Canby, with a force of 2,400 strong, tracked the retreating invaders along the Rio Grande. The retreat would cover over 100 miles. At the end of the New Mexico campaign, Sibley assumed command of his army again in Louisiana. But at the Battle of Bislin, again, he was a miserable failure. His leadership was bad. Alcohol had taken its toll. And as a consequence, he was court-martialed. And although he was acquitted, that effectively ended his career in the Confederate Army. He died a sad, almost pathetic death at Fredericksburg, Virginia in poverty in 1886. Perhaps a fitting part of his legacy is that the date of death on his tombstone is wrong.